Good morning. It's lovely to be with you again this morning and to bring you this word as we continue looking at our series of the Beatitudes. This is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we've already heard how Jesus brought blessings upon the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the weak, the meek, the righteous, the merciful, and the pure in heart. Today, as we look at the message that I've got for you, I am at my Baptist best. I am bringing you a message with four points. They all start with M. We're going to look at the model of a peacemaker, the meaning of a peacemaker, the method of a peacemaker, and the mantle of a peacemaker. And we're going to start by looking at what it means to be a peacemaker. It's not very long ago that we had a series on the meaning of shalom. We learned that shalom is the Hebrew name for peace, but it means so much more than peace. It also means harmony, wholeness, completeness and prosperity, welfare and tranquility, all things that bring us into full relationship with God. To understand what a peacemaker is, it's helpful to notice what it's not. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace wishers, or the peace hopers, or the peace dreamers, or the peace lovers, or the peace talkers. Peace must be made. Peace never happens by chance. A peacemaker is never passive. They always take the initiative. They are up and doing. So the idea of being a peacemaker is one that describes who actively pursues peace. The peacemaker pursues more than an absence of conflict. They aren't merely seeking to appease the warring parties. They aren't trying to accommodate everyone. Instead, they are pursuing all the beauty and blessedness of God upon another person. As William Barclay translates this verse, they are people who produce right relationships in every sphere of life. As I was preparing for this sermon, I have read many moving stories of peacemakers of all ages in all parts of the world. And if you want an uplifting read, I recommend this free online publication called 25 Stories for Peace. This is a book celebrating young people who have been peace building through an organisation called the United Network of Young Peace Builders. It tells of experiences of young women and men who have contributed to peace in communities on every continent, and it's inspiring. In it, I read accounts of people like Abarami, who has helped to bring safety and equality to women and children living in refugee camps who've been the victims of physical and sexual violence by soldiers. Or Sabia, who was just a small girl in Bosnia during the Balkans War. But because of the experience that she had as a child, she's now studying international relations and working for an NGO in Sarajevo creating social communities for young people from all the former Yugoslavian states to build a peaceful future together. And I also read about Sarah, a young Israeli woman working for an online peace movement, bringing people together from the Middle East and North Africa, educating them about forgiveness and reconciliation and helping them to make positive changes for their communities and their countries. Peacemaking is about calming the troubled waters of humankind's discord. It's about bringing shalom, bringing God's kingdom to earth. So let's look at our model for peacemaking. Peacemaking is divine work. God is the author of peace and Jesus is the supreme peacemaker. Jesus came to establish peace. To, his message explains peace. 
his death gained peace and his resurrection, his resurrected presence enables peace. The messianic predictions about Jesus were that he would be the prince of peace. And the angels announced his birth by singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to the, his, the people he favours. Jesus' persistent word of absolution to sinners was go in peace. Just before he was crucified, Jesus' last will and testament was, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world does. Your heart must not be troubled or fearful. And when the Lord returned after the resurrection, his first words to his disciples were, Shalom, peace to you. The life of Jesus was saturated with his mission of bringing peace, the peace of God, and to initiate healing relationships of peace with God. He paid an enormous price for us to experience peace. In fact, the very same word, peacemakers, which is used in his Beatitudes, is applied by the Apostle Paul to what God has done through Christ so that we could be at peace with God. He said, through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of the cross. And furthermore, Paul informed us that Jesus might create in himself one new man from two, resulting in peace. Jesus saw the gravity of our problem and he refused to sweep it under the carpet or to stick his head in the sand. Only a drastic solution would suffice. And so he made peace by shedding his blood on a cross. Christ is our supreme example of bringing reconciliation through peace. Peace in our hearts, our relationships, our church, our nation and our world. He is our model of being a peacemaker. So how do we go about being peacemakers? Well, the task is not easy and it might not always be pretty. And those who do it will often be misunderstood. In 1781, Ben Franklin wrote to John Adams, Blessed are the pacemakers is, I suppose, for another world. In this world, they are frequently cursed. It is tricky, tricky to please people. The hallmark of a Christian is the ability to get along with other people. And the testimony of the church is its ability to get along with other people. We have a God-given, scripturally directed responsibility to pursue peace. The Apostle Paul declared, it is to peace that God has called you. So does that mean that we should agree with everything that other people say? I don't think it does. Sometimes we have to disagree agreeably. God wants his children to be bridge builders. So what can you and I do to be those bridge builders of peace? What steps, what methods can we employ to actively reconcile people with God and with one another? Just as an example, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my role as community minister at Graven Hill. I had a kind of a picture of what my job might look like when I took it. I imagined a lot of coffee and cake and chatting, some gentle pastoral prayers to bring people into the light and love of God. I expected that I would be fostering friendships and putting on events that would bring people together and form a strong community. And there has been some of that. But as my morale develops, I have to say it's not really that. There hasn't been nearly enough coffee or cake. Since people have got to know me and they've understood that I stand with them and for them, my role has become one of peacemaker. 
I've been forming people into groups so that they can work together to solve the problems that they're experiencing. Because I believe that with a shared knowledge and a larger number, they have more power. Often, the problems that they're experiencing are within the social housing, and often there are, is uh, poor workmanship in the houses, which the authorities have not been dealing with. Sometimes my role has been to lead and empower the residents to stand up for what they want for their community, what they want it to look like, even when the authorities are trying to impose something different and unjust. And I have encountered a surprising amount of injustice. Recently, my role was to intercede on behalf of people whose houses flooded because the building company had failed to build sufficient flood protection into their part of the estate. And at the same time, I was being asked by those authorities to contain the problem and to stop them from being de demonised in the press. I stand in the middle of those experiencing difficulty and those who have power but are often not the will to fix the problem. I have been trying to reach solutions for justice and peace. And I find this surprising given that we live in a relatively prosperous area in one of the richest and most de democratically formed countries in the world. Most of my time is taken up with injustice and disempowered people calling for a peaceful and predictable life. I'm not quite the community minister that I, th I thought I would be. I'm more of a diplomat and a negotiator. But God has led me to be a peacemaker in Bista. Each of us is called to find our way to act justly, to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. It's in our role as peacemaker that we find ourselves becoming the children of God. That is the mantle that we take on. A child of God is not only one who carries on the family name, but also one who bears the family re re resemblance and the reputation. Jesus is saying that as his children, his followers, we become peacemakers and we'll be recognized as the children of God who share his name and his mission. Christ's radical call to peacemaking demands a radical remaking of our human personality. We must first have a profound experience of the shalom of God ourselves. No one can become a peacemaker until they have found peace themselves. We cannot give what is not real to us. Peacemaking begins with an experience of peace in our hearts. And so my call to you this morning would to be to be peacemakers, but first in your own life. Worship together this morning. Orientate yourselves towards Jesus each day so that you can remind yourself of the deep and profound love and grace that God has for you through Jesus. That way you can gen genuinely know the peace of God in your heart. And then look at how you can share that peace with others. In the words of the song that we're about to sing, where there is hatred, bring love. Where there is despair, bring hope. And where there is doubt, bring true faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker. We pray that as we look to him, that we too would be channels of your peace. As we live out our faith, equip us to bring joy to those who know sadness, to bring hope where fear is present, and to be beacons of light to all those we meet. Amen.